Hey there, do you have questions about carriage driving? Like what is the right age to start a horse for carriage driving? Or is it safe to canter a horse in the harness in the carriage with all the flappy bits around? Maybe you don't know about snap shackles and why you might need them on your breeching hold back straps or how to get a horse a little less sensitive to the whip. Well, this video is for you because I'm gonna start doing some regular videos where I take questions off of the Ask Andy page on coachmansdelight.com and answer them in short little video notes like this one right here. So the answers to the questions I just posed plus a few more are coming right up. My name's Andy Marku. I'm a professional horse trainer in the sport of carriage driving. I've been driving horses for about 25 years, give or take. It's really been my only career. Uh, my website, coachmansdelight.com, is where I share all of my training tips through blog posts, uh, downloadable lesson plans and articles, videos like this one, and most importantly, online classes. If you've taken some of the online classes and you've enjoyed them, do me a favor, hit the like button or uh, leave a review for one of the classes that you've taken so other people know that they're really useful, full of information that you get to put to use with your pony right away. All right, so let's dive right into the questions. Anne asked me about cantering in harness and shared with me that it was her experience that there are a lot of people who feel like it's really dangerous and it's sketchy to canter a horse in harness because you know you build up a lot of speed and boy, that's pretty close to a runaway, isn't it? Uh, and there are a lot of other people who hold the opinion that you shouldn't canter horses in harness. I remember uh, growing up in carriage driving, uh, we never cantered our horses in harness because it was considered gauche. It was considered something that, well, you just didn't do. Only commercial drivers who were driving stagecoaches or that sort of thing cantered their horses in harness. And a lot of the reasons for that are well, the carriage can get kind of uncomfortable when you're carry, cantering in harness because the horse has a little bit more of a lurching movement. And during that stride cycle of the canter, you know, all four feet are coming up and off of the ground. And that horse is decelerating just a little bit while you're cantering in harness. Um, but the safety aspect, you know, well, that's kind of a, a sticky wicket, isn't it? Yes, a horse can get spooked from cantering in harness because we've got all that harness around them. And during the trot and the walk, that harness kind of follows along with his body really nicely. But during a canter, you've got that lurching movement that I was just talking about. And you're having all that harness kind of rise up and fall against the horse. And the traces are close by the horse's flanks. And there are just a lot of flappy bits with harness. So when we start cantering, there's a lot more action and there's a lot more noise to the cantering. So that can feel really unfamiliar to a horse and it could lead to a spook. But here's the question. Would you rather find out that that's a really spooky experience for the horse when he's having a spook? Because, you know, if your horse hasn't cantered in harness, but then you hear, you know, he hears a scary noise behind him and all of a sudden he gets a little bit of a spook and he makes a little break to the canter. Well, then all of a sudden now he's got that spooky noise and all the extra noise of the harness and the carriage and that harness flapping him. And maybe that sends him on into something bigger. Maybe that sends him on into a bolt. Maybe that sends him on to a, into a runaway. So my recommendation is, yeah, once the horse has a little bit of experience in harness, in the carriage driving, yes, I do introduce the horse to cantering. And I do that in a fairly controlled set of circumstances. Uh, I like to do that in a 
enclosed arena and I like to do that when I uh, have checked all of the harness over checking for fit and checking for you know the where wear and tear on the harness because what's going to happen in the cantering especially when the horse is new to it is it's going to be kind of lurchy so you want to definitely check make sure that you don't have wear points on your harness and that your hitching is really spot on now when i say that your hitching is spot on a lot of people uh, have really loose breaching uh, and so i can show you a picture of what that looks like over here in this page right there so you know a lot of people hook their horses up and feel like the breaching has been correctly adjusted and just standing there you know chill and mellow they'll say oh yeah look i can put a hand in between the breaching and my horse's butt so the adjustment must be right well if we look just over where those traces are we can see that the traces are pretty slack here and uh the breaching is slack as well so that really equates to actually loose breaching what you need to do when it's time to uh, check your breaching is actually pull the carriage into draft so you pull those traces nice and snug and now that's when you should be able to stick one hand behind the breaching just to make sure that the horse has enough room to move now if you couldn't get that hand in when you pulled the the traces snug well then that breaching would be a little bit too tight maybe that would scare the horse a little bit and maybe send him on especially if he was getting into a canter where he's taking a little bit longer stride sometimes when he's new to it uh, the other big thing about when you're starting that canter is do it in a very planned way so I already mentioned that you should do it in an enclosed area you know a ring an indoor arena uh, somewhere where he has enough room to move so like a round pen especially with a carriage would be too small uh, but you know a riding size arena where you know your horse is enclosed so if things get a little exciting he's not going to run off over hill and dale with you right uh, but then choose a lesson plan that's really predictable and really consistent something that you've worked with before the two lesson plans that i use for this kind of training uh, one of them actually surprisingly enough is a cones lesson plan that i use for teaching people and horses how to rate their their uh different trots their different speeds you know that field goal lesson plan is all about being able to dial your horse back and slow him through some really tight little turns and then allow him to take larger strides bigger strides in a more ground covering trot or perhaps canter once you've worked with the lesson plan a few times uh, and then be able to bring him back once you've worked that lesson plan at the work walk and trot a couple of times then you can start to introduce the canter because the horse knows the exercise and the exercise he knows is oh yeah we go fast from here to there but then we have to slow down and we have to take this little bit really slowly the other lesson plan that works really well for this is the dial exercise because it's really repetitive and it's got a lot of transitions and once you've gotten that horse started on that dial exercise he kind of falls into a groove with it and then he you know develops that expectation of how that lesson plan is going you can easily fold in just a little bit of canter work into that lesson plan as well you can just build right on top of that lesson plan the next question that i want to get to comes from and i am going to totally murder your name here i believe it's gray from oregon but it's g-r-a-e so i'm not sure if that's uh how i pronounce that name anyway gray asks me uh hey andy i started a horse who's 18 months old he's uh half thoroughbred half dutch harness horse uh, and or 
Dutch warm blood and he's Westphalian registered. In other words, this horse has way more papers than I do. Sounds like a really cool horse. Um, how much driving can I do without hurting him? And I've never had a young horse that I've gotten started, so I'm getting mixed answers. And also I noticed that one of Gray's friends posted in there, hey, before anybody gets upset, he's using a really light pipe cart. All right, my take on when to start horses for uh, carriage driving. I like to go get them started when they're coming to be three years old. So I usually choose for like November or October, late in the year when they're going to be turning three. So we're presuming that all horses turn three in January, right? More or less, but not really. Uh, but end of their second year, so more than 24 months old, more closer to that 36 month year old, month year old uh, timeline. Uh, the reason I like to, you know, wait until then is because of their bone development. It's mostly, I mean, they can have the maturity to handle it. And especially if it's a really sweet horse, yeah, that's great. But you know, the bone development is the biggest thing that you want to think of when we're thinking about the young horses. And so here we've got this little diagram that just shows uh, kind of the parts and pieces of the bone. And the way bone grows is it sort of creates this cartilage on the very end of the bone and that cartilage hardens over time. When we start working young horses, uh, you know, that haven't had the time to develop that uh, bone on the very end, we can kind of do some uneven wear on that, especially if we're not really mindful about making sure that we're working them symmetrically. So that's the biggest place where you could really cause some damage on some young horses. Now we know that thoroughbreds get start, started very early in their lives. You know, they're typically that 18 month range when they're starting to get exercised and things like that. But when we're talking about um, heavier bred horses, certainly draft horses, certainly uh, warm bloods, a lot of those types of horses, that bone development carries on well into their fifth and sometimes sixth or even seventh year before that bone has really hardened and, and gotten nice and set. So I like to wait until they're at least coming three so that they've got some good bone development. And the reason I like to wait until the late fall to start the horse is, well, winter kind of builds a forced break into that uh, development into the training of that horse. So it keeps us from taking it too far for the young horse, right? And I've also always found that for a horse mentally, having a period where we get the horse started, now maybe I'll just do some ground driving, a little bit of light long lining, maybe some introduction of the harness. If the horse is really solid, you know, a really quiet warm blood or a really quiet Morgan, I mean, Morgans, they, they, they're just like, yeah, get the carriage, let's, let's go. We, we know what to do with this. Um, they can be really easy to start, but then it's nice to have, maybe that takes a month or two to get that whole process started. And then you end up with a break. We get into this time of year, into January. It's miserable, it's cold, the footing, it just sucks. We don't wanna go out and work horses. So they get a month or two off. And that just seems to build in a really, really great break in their training. So I love using that period of time. If you're in the deep south, you know, you're in southern Florida or Texas or some of those climates where it's actually nice to work the horses over winter and miserable to work the horses over summer, well then just wait until May or April when you can get that horse started, but pretty soon you're gonna get into June and July and it's gonna get too hot. Now your horse gets that built-in break. 
So those are my thoughts. Um, going specifically to your question, Gray, uh, I would say, hey, take it easy with that guy. I'm glad you got him started. Uh, everything probably is going pretty well. If you wanna do a little bit of stuff with him, fine. I would say keep it really mellow. 10, 20 minute sessions, definitely not a lot of circling at that age. Give him another year. You're gonna have that horse for a long time. Being anxious right now, could cost you lo longevity and service life. Uh, so, how old was your horse when you started him? I'm interested to see what the age ranges are. Uh, and of course, for carriage driving, yeah, you can start them when they're 15. You know, you can have those second career horses and stuff like that. See them all the time. Now, this is kind of related. So, Deb from Washington has asked on the Ask Andy page on my website, or yeah, maybe she asked on the Facebook page. Doesn't really matter. Once uh, your horse is good and well broke and fit and started and he's competing and all of that, do you ever give him an extended period of time off? And my answer to that question is, well, yeah, because we all have a life, right? We all have other things that come up even during the middle of the competition season. Uh, certainly, uh, most of our horses get some pretty extended time off or even horses who stay in work, kind of air quotes at this time of year. Uh, if you're up in the great cold north like me, yeah, you're only maybe working once or twice a week. For a competitive horse, I consider that time off. Uh, and it's fine, it's actually good for the horse to have a little bit of time off. Different horses react a little bit differently in terms of fitness, and that's where you're going to see uh, changes. You are going to see uh, more of a decline in fitness from longer periods of time off. If the horse is a heavier breed horse, if he's had issues getting fit in the past, um, and if he's, if he's somebody who ha takes a long time to get fit from a cardiovascular standpoint. So a breed that I'm thinking of right now that you know is really tough to get fit with good wind for cardio are Frisians. Man, they just, it takes a long time to get their cardio up. You have to do a lot of work with them. You have to do a lot of transitions and a lot of walking to get their, their lungs really conditioned to a lot of work and they lose that fitness rather quickly. Now if we go over towards the other end of the spectrum, you know, Morgans and Saddlebreds, Standardbreds, uh, those lighter, you know, what we call hotter horses, they have a tendency to carry their fitness longer. Uh, my horse was a Saddlebred and God, that horse was fit all the time, whether I was had them in full-time work or not. The one thing that I want to caution people, and I often have to remind people uh, about, is when they have their competitive horse or their horse that they just love working a lot, and maybe they have flexibility of time, they're not working, maybe you're retired, and so you can go out there and work your horse seven days a week, Great, but you gotta remember to give that horse a day off to just kinda chill out and not do too much work, okay? So be moderate, be reasonable. If your horse has been working for 15 days in a row, man, give them a little bit of time off. If you're just coming home from a big competition and you've had a big effort, a big ask from your horse, yeah, you wanna give him a little bit of time to recover. Now, the one thing that I will say, let's say we're coming home from a combined driving event and you know, that's a big marathon. And of course, nobody gets to go to a combined driving event that's about you know 30 minutes down the road, do they? Our, our combined driving events are spread out all over the country. So most of us, I know for me, the closest combined driving event is about three hours away. So that trailer ride was actually a big physical effort on the horse. So appreciate that. But 
what I do like to do is give the horse a little bit of activity the day after, especially if I don't have great turnout where the horse isn't going to necessarily exercise himself in the turnout. It's good to get him out, maybe lunge him a little, long line him a little, maybe a little uh, short uh, ride or a little short drive, just walks trot stuff because Think about it, if you've ever done anything that was a huge physical effort, maybe you did like two days of just hardcore skiing or uh, you went on a big hike, you climbed a mountain or you know you helped your friend move hay and if you do nothing the next day, the day after that, maybe it was Sunday that you had the big effort and Monday you did absolutely nothing but sit in a chair because you were tired. Tuesday you're going to be miserable. Your muscles are going to be super achy, super sore. But if Monday you go out and you do some physical activity, not throwing 50 or 100 or 1000 bales up in the loft, but you know, just some daily activity, you'll be less sore in the days in the following week. So horses kind of work the same. It's nice to make sure that they get a little bit of exercise when they've come home from a big effort. So what else do we have for questions here? Um, we have a question from, I know it's from Quebec and it was Claudette. And she asks, do you recommend the use of panic snaps on your breaching? Uh, so panic snaps on the breaching. Well, let's just start with talking about snaps on the breaching and why you would do that. So where you tie your breaching off to the shafts on your carriage, you can actually put a snap onto the breaching so that it snaps right into the breaching ring uh, on the harness. And that can make uh, getting your horse hitched and unhitched a little bit quicker and easier. And if you wanted to use panic snaps, if you had to unhitch in a hurry, well then that will you know, facilitate unhitching in a hurry. So the place where I'm gonna use, ask you to use caution here is when we use the term panic snaps, a lot of times we're looking at like the cross tie panic snaps. That's usually what people think of when we say panic snaps. Uh, and those I wouldn't use on my breaching. And I also don't like using the, the thumb type snaps that a lot of people use on breaching because uh, it's really kind of an effort to get those th thumb snaps open and then pulling the, the breaching ring off and if you're trying to get unhooked in an emergency, well they're really no faster than unbuckling. Uh, they can get bound up but also those those thumb snaps will have a tendency to, uh, the, the little spring in them breaks all the time. It, you know they just drive you crazy and then you're driving along down the trail and you look over the, at the shafts and you realize oh no my breaching's undone. So that can get a little dodgy. Uh, I do use snap shackles though, and that's a whole different class of snap than the snaps that we've looked at. These are actual safety devices. They're primarily used in sailing. Um, I would love it if somebody were to send me a picture, if somebody out there is a sailor, go ahead and send me a picture of where you use these on the boats and why you want them to be quick release. Anyway, the great thing about a snap shackle is it's designed to release while it's under pressure. It's designed to take a load and they're very high load bearing, but it has this little plunger in it so that if you're in a dodgy situation, for example, if your carriage is turned over or your horse is turned over or you're stuck somewhere and all the harness is under tension, well, you can just simply pull that snap, the little pull chain on the snap and that snap will pop open nice and quickly. As long as you keep those snaps clean, they will also stay closed really quite reliably. And so if we look at the picture over on the right hand side of the screen, let's take a little zoom in on that and we can see how we take that from the breaching wrapped off to the ring just there and snap it into 
the breaching ring. And we can use that on two wheel and four wheel carriages. And I think it's a great idea. I use them all the time. It makes it safer if you do get into a bit of a tight spot with your horse where you need to unhitch in a hurry. And it makes hitching and unhitching a far more efficient process. You're uh, doing, you know, much less wrapping and turning around and everything like that and buckling. Uh, and so you're spending less time in that hitching and unhitching process. You've probably heard me say before that, you know, hey, hitching and unhitching is probably the most dangerous part of your drive. So anything that we can do to make that more efficient, I am absolutely all for it. Okay, so moving on to other questions here. Let's see, I am going to move on to uh, another question about horses fitness and the best way to keep the horse sound and happy through for a long life, for longevity. Uh, this is where I'd like to say, hey man, don't be afraid of dressage. Dressage is your friend. I know a lot of people uh, hear the term dressage and think, oh man, that means like, you know, really strict training and everything like that. But dressage, think, let's, let's change that term. Let's call it Tai Chi for horses. And being methodical about how you work your horse is really going to make his work easier, which is going to make him happier. And if the horse's work is easier, he's going to um, last longer, right? He's going to have better muscle development. Everything about dressage is all about moving in the most efficient manner for your horse's body. So getting a nice swing to his stride, getting his legs to come up and underneath him, and, um, you know, using really good balance. So that's all about body mechanics. And so, using some lesson plans that you know give you some good foundations to get good healthy movement very much the way we would like that movement in the dressage ring even if you don't even plan to go to the dressage ring you don't have to do a dressage test but you can still use everything that you can learn from that venue uh, and then everything that i've said about you know consistent work yes give your horse some time off uh, if he has a month or two off, you go back at it slowly. But then if you can if you can avoid it, if your lifestyle allows, you know, keep him in work. Horses love having a job and that keeps them going. Okay, so uh, one last quick question and then I'm going to let you go. And I'm going to answer the question from Joshua who asks, how do you teach a horse uh, that a whip doesn't mean just go faster? Well, that's where I really like doing a lot of those moving off the whip exercises. So when I start teaching a horse more about what the whip means, I go through my moving off the whip lesson plans where I actually work with the, hand, the horse in hand on the cross ties. I sit there and I pat the horse with a whip. Oh yeah, fluffy pants. Yes, you're a very nice boy. And I just, maybe I do a little bit of treat training to get him to be more settled with the whip. And then I do some exercises where I just, you know, ask the horse to move with my hand. And then I ask the horse to move with the whip in my hand and start teaching the horse that the whip has much more meaning than zoom, zoom right? And I bring that training from the barn into the arena and I'll typically once again continue that training in hand doing a little bit of moving left and right from the whip and then I carry that whip training into the carriage and teach the horse to stand well. I just did the stand lesson plan and class last week. It's still available online on my class on my uh, website. Throw a big like if you were there for that class. Uh, let people know how fun that class really is and how effective it is for your horse. Um, 
but I get the horse to stand still and then I ask him to move away from the whip at the stand. So now we've broken down that, you know, pure association that whip means go faster, right? Oh, the whip is, you know, a little bit more nuanced than that. Uh, so that's sh sort of a short answer, uh, but if you check out some of the moving off the whip uh, programming that I have on my website, you, there are some lesson plans that'll be helpful. Uh, probably later in the year, I'll give the moving off the whip a class. It's a really great class to help your horse understand how to move off the whip. One last note on that little bit on the whip. When I had my horse who was hyper whip sensitive, oh my God, he was a drag. Um, I really had to do a lot of that training. And then I found out that he was happier in an open bridle without blinders. And he was a much better driving horse, but now he could see the whip. So that took a little while. And it took a lot of standing around in the carriage and just touches with the whip. And then also just being very conscious myself about not being lazy about how I was carrying the whip. So I wasn't doing incidental touches and when I did use the whip to communicate to him that it was often, you know, accentuated with a verbal command so he knew, oh, that was a whip command. Okay, so I usually try to keep these under 20 or 30 minutes. I think I'm right here in at the 30 minute mark, so I should probably let you go. Uh, if you have questions, and I apologize if I didn't get to all of your questions, I appreciate people uh, poking the questions into the Facebook uh, live feed here. I'll try to get to those questions a little bit later on. Uh, any other questions that you have, by all means, go over to my website and go to the Ask Andy section. You can just put in coachmansdelight.com backslash Ask Andy. That's really easy way to do it uh, and drop your questions in there. I really make an effort to make sure I get an answer to all of those questions and a lot of times those questions are really great because they help me think of a great idea for a video or a blog post and so sometimes you get kind of the extended dance version of an answer to your question. If you enjoyed this video, please, by all means, hit the like button, share this video with your friends. If you're watching the rebroadcast of this video on YouTube, do me a favor, go ahead and subscribe. That helps me out. It opens up some tools on, on the website there that I can provide some more links and some information for you to get more info on carriage driving. All right, that's it. I really appreciate it for being here and um, sorry if I'm not saying your name here on Facebook. There are too many lights. I got to do something with the lighting in here so I can actually read that screen over there. Thanks for coming. Have a great rest of your day. Take care.